Amen. I welcome everyone to our workers' training meeting tonight in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this uh, workers' training meeting. Thank you for all our workers all over the nation, all our workers beyond Nigeria, in Africa, and other places. Thank you because of connecting us together tonight, united in your word. We're asking, O oh Lord, you speak to everyone by your spirit in Jesus' name. Strengthen your people. Help us, Lord, to move forward in the work you have committed to our hands in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see them. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. I think you know already, but I'll remind you that already we had our building the body in, um, from chapter 2 of Acts. And we read from verse 37 to verse 40. We're going to look over those verses again, but now from another perspective. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 37 now. When they heard this, they were preached in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, give me that word, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. We're going to join verses 41 and 42. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them, how many people? About 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. As we look at those verses, we're treating the topic, the first Pentecostal crusade. The first Pentecostal crusade. Have you noticed that this chapter, as it opens up, it tells us about the day of Pentecost. And then it tells us that many people are gathered from various places, from various nations. And it tells us from where they came from. Because there was a feast of the Jews referred to as Pentecost. Verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Then the Holy Ghost came upon them. Verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. They all came from those various nations to attend the Feast of Pentecost. And now the word is going to tell us who they are. Now, when this was noised abroad, an event had taken place. The Holy Ghost had come. Power, fire, wind, sound had come. And that drew the people together. And it says the multitude came together on that very day. And they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And it says they were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these all these who speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue? We are in we were born. That was the central language that everybody understood. 
But these people also add their languages. And the speaking in tongues actually came through to them in those various languages. And it says they were glorifying God. It goes on to say in verse 9, Patience, the people there, Medes, the people who are there, the Elamites, those who are there, Dwellers in Mesopotamia, those who are there, and even in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, and then in verse 7, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, and Jews, and proselytes. Verse 11 says, people even came from Crete, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue, in our local language, in our dialect, the wonderful works of God. As I said, you look at the whole chapter and it gives you the uh, event that was the first Pentecostal crusade in Jerusalem. It was at Jerusalem. It was the largest city in the nation. It was the most populated city in the nation. It was an historical city. And it was a religious city as well in that nation. You must have heard there's a crusade ahead of us. And how wonderful that we're looking at this. And it came, it is in our own systematic uh, teaching in the building the body. We're not specially lifting this out. This just came. And it came at the right time because God is a master planner. If you agree with us, say amen. amen. A great gospel crusade is coming ahead of us from November the 8th until the 12th. And you know if you have heard that the whole church, the life in Lagos here, all the districts, all the groups, everywhere, all of us are involved. I'm involved. You are involved. Give me a good amen. All our group pastors and reps are involved. Another amen. All our workers without exception. A good thing is taking place. You will not be left out. I said I will not be left out. From the very first day on the 8th of November, you'll be there. Am I talking to somebody there? What are you? You'll be there. There will be proper transportation arrangement. Everybody will be there in Jesus' name. All members of Deep and Life in the whole of Lagos State and even in the neighboring states around. If you are hearing the voice, you are hearing the message now, and you are all around, and you are near that location, the location is uh, near a DLCC. It's a very wonderful place. Thank God I'll be there. I say thank God I'll be there. I want a voice that looks like you have the Holy Ghost inside you. God bless you, you'll be there. The people had come from many nations, many provinces, and they had come from many communities. The disciples were there, the apostles were there. They had been tarrying and waiting. They had been praying for the Holy Ghost. And on this wonderful day now, the expected day had come, and the pouring of the Holy Ghost came upon them. Then came this day. And as uh, the day came, Holy Ghost coming upon sons, upon daughters, upon the disciples, upon the servants of the Lord, then with the wind it came. Then with the fire it also came. With sound and with light it came. It was a great refreshing for them. It was a great renewal for them. With boldness and power, with courage and zeal, and with uh, insight and impact, the quickening power of the Holy Ghost came upon them. They began to speak in another language, other tongues, many languages actually, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Tongues and wonders joined together. It pulled the people together. It served like a publicity agent. And for this uh, crusade coming in, uh, the publicity has been going on, on radio, on television, and uh, through uh, the social media, and through handbills and posters. And then you can even see on the side of the buses in the town, you can see this uh, crusade uh, coming. And uh, all the churches are cooperating together, and our church too, we are cooperating together with this uh, crusade. Then, as the people gather together, 
Paul, Peter rose up and he began to speak to them. Look at verse 14. But Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And hearken to my words. He began to talk to them and to preach to them. He lifted up his voice and the word came with power unto them. And then he goes on to say in verse 37, Now when they had heard, they heard the message. As they are coming there, they are coming with your invitees. We are distributing operation and catch. And in that operation, Andrew Card, you have a ten uh, spaces there. But we're expecting that you will invite and by friend, by contact, personal contact. You're going to contact at least ten people. And then you have their numbers, you have their names there. Their telephone numbers are also there. And then as you do that, before that crusade, you'll be sending that uh, number and the names you send to the IT representative of every district. Already they are appointed. Your coordinator will know them and introduce them to you. And then from each of those uh, districts, we're sending that to the group as well. So that already we've captured all those names. We've captured the numbers even before that day. And then you are praying for them. If you got uh, more than 10, you go for another card and then you are registering them. As you register them, we we'll capture them and we we'll send them to the central location. It must be done in an orderly manner. And this is uh, the, the Holy Ghost himself that did this for them on that day. And the people came together and they heard the word of God. They were convicted of their sins. There's going to be conviction of sin in that crusade. And they were converted. It's good to be conversion in that crusade. The mighty power of God came upon them and it was a great sight. And then we are told about uh, how many people were given to the Lord, born again, converted. How many people? 3,000. How many disciples were waiting in the upper room that had the Holy Ghost on them, coming upon them? How many people? 120. 3,000 over 120 is 25. That means that as you think about the follow-up, each of those people, if they were to divide the number, the people they were to follow up, they'll be following up each person, 25. Think about yourself there, 25. Think about yourself there, 25. Each person following up, 25 people. If they were to put them in different local churches, there were 12 apostles, 12 preachers. And if you divide 3,000 by 12, you're going to have 250. It will mean that each of those churches, if each apostle had a local church, each church will increase by 250 people. 250 converts, they'll baptize them, they will train them, they will disciple them. There's a lot of work to be done even after that crusade. And after this crusade coming, there's going to be follow up. You are going to be involved. And churches are going to be planted because of this crusade. And the disciples are going to come in because of this crusade. This is not the time for anybody to take vacation, for anybody to travel, for anybody to say, you know, I need to go and visit this and visit this. Everybody at this time, after the crusade and after we've done the follow-up, you can travel, but you still have to tell us and take permission. You cannot just travel. You let us know. But at this time now, everybody getting involved i said everybody getting involved am i talking to excited people are you going to be involved i said are you going to be there you'll be there in jesus name now let's look at the things we have to do and let us look at what is going on here according to this chapter of the word we're looking at the first pentecostal crusade there are three things number one Powerful proclamation with convicting fire. Powerful proclamation with convicting fire. Point number two, the promised Pentecost for Christ's followers. The promised Pentecost for Christ's followers. Point number three, proper preservation of the crusade fruit. The proper preservation of of the crusade fruit. Number one, tell me number one. 
I'm waiting for you. One, two, three, go tell me. Proper proclamation, uh, the powerful proclamation with convicting fire. Uh, look at what happened to them. Because when the Holy Ghost came upon them, it came with power. It came with fire. Look at uh, chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as, a, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the, all the house, the whole house, where they were seated. And there appeared unto them clubbing tongues like a of fire and it sat on each of them and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave utterance and then he tells us we're talking about the proclamation in verse 14 here is the proclamation peter standing up with the 11 one evangelist is going to speak a two evangelists cannot speak at the same time. Three ten cannot speak at the same time. We gather the people together. We invite the people. And then here now, it was the, it was the evangelist Peter, the apostle Peter. He says, for Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Galilee, ye men of uh, Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. And as he spoke to them, he spoke about Christ. He spoke about the life of Christ. He spoke about the power of Christ. He spoke about the death of Christ. He spoke about the resurrection of Christ. When we talk about gospel, this crusade coming is a great gospel crusade gospel crusade and when we're preaching the gospel we're talking about christ in the savior we're talking about christ who died on the cross of calvary we're talking about christ who was buried after he died and then he rose again for our justification and peter went through everything but then he was very clear that he pointed at them the message was pointed and the message was poignant, and the message was powerful, and then at the end of the message, look at verse 37, now when they heard this convicting word that came with fire, that came with power, when they heard, it says they were preached in their hearts, and they said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I want you to understand, when the Holy Ghost comes, he comes with fire power. Fire power. Look at the promise the Lord had given, and this same power is available for you. I said this same fire is available for you. Acts in, a, in a Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you, look at this, with the Holy Ghost and with Tell me out aloud. With fire. You know, if you say you're filled with the Holy Ghost, there must be that fire power inside you. There must be the fire of the Holy Ghost. In fact, that's, that's why we read in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. If you put a kettle on fire with water, the water must boil. There must be heat. There must be, there must be vapor. And that's what the Lord did for them. Those who have been quiet. Those who have been silent, those who have been fearful, and those who have been timid, and those who have been denied, like Peter said, no, I don't know him. Just a few days ago, a few weeks ago, but now the power came. The power is coming upon you. And the fire came, and the fire is coming upon your heart. Look at verse 3, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 3, and there appeared unto them, cloving tongues, like a of fire, and it sat on each of them. You will not miss your own part. You will not miss your portion. And as you go in the power of the Holy Ghost, and you are part of this crusade, that fire will spread everywhere. You'll be a torch for the Lord. You'll be a firebrand for the Lord. You'll be a zealous soul winner for the Lord in Jesus' name. Actually, the Lord had said, when he was giving them the promise of the Holy Ghost in John chapter 16, 
John chapter 16, reading from verse 7. When he was giving them the promise of the Holy Ghost, he told them, when they speak, conviction will come. When they speak, the, the pinching power, the pricking power of the Holy Ghost will come in the hearts of the people they were preaching to. That's why it says in John chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, profitable, good, better for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. He has departed and is sending the Holy Ghost to you. I said he's sending the Holy Ghost to you. Power is coming in your life. Illumination is coming in your life. Insight is coming in your life. Authority, conviction is coming upon your life in Jesus' name. In verse 8, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. If you are preaching in the power of the Holy Ghost, the sinners who are listening will have conviction. They will be convicted of their sin. And then it says, of righteousness and of judgment of sin, because they believe not on me. All those who have not believed, all those who have not been saved, all those who have not been converted, there will be conviction coming upon them. And it says of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, of judgment, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And then Jesus went on telling them what that power of the Holy Ghost will do, what that fire of the Holy Ghost will do. As they spoke the word of God. Actually, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, are you a minister? Are you a preacher? Are you a soul winner? Are you a leader in the kingdom of God? It makes you a flame of fire. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews. I'm reading from chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 7. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. And of the angel, he says, who maketh his angel spirit and his ministers, tell me, a flame of fire. You know, if somebody is preaching and is almost falling asleep while preaching, that's not the preaching of the Holy Ghost power. If somebody is preaching and then is dull, is not alive, is not active, is witnessing. He stands up in the bus and is witnessing. He's on the street, is witnessing. And then the voice is so dull and everything is saying, I mean, people who are hearing almost falling asleep. That's not preaching in the power of the Holy Ghost, but it says the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Power comes upon your life. Conviction comes through the word you are preaching and the fire of the Holy Ghost through you will make sure that all the chaff in that congregation will be burnt up by the fire of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. That's why Jesus Christ promised the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's why he gave us this baptism, this immersion. And he said, he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. The Holy Ghost power, the Holy Ghost fire, the Holy Ghost conviction is not only for the evangelist, it's not only for the apostle, it's for everyone and it's for you. I said it's for you. That's why, that's why Peter told the people, he said, repent, and ye shall be baptized for the remission of your sins. And he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then he said, in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, it says, for the gift is, the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to many that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, you will receive. I said, you will receive. And when you receive and then you speak in the power, in the fire of the Holy Ghost, it will be seen, it will be visible because of that conviction that comes upon the people. Uh, let's come to uh, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. When the fire comes, when the power comes, and then the Lord sends you forth, and the Lord sends the preacher forth, see what will happen. Isaiah chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. There's a real live coal, having fire, having heat. And then he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, 
this has touched thy leaves. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. For Isaiah, this was a sanctification experience. I pray the Lord will sanctify every consecrated soul in Jesus' name. Purifying their hearts by faith. He will purify our hearts. Circumcise our hearts. Purge our hearts. And the fire that comes in will burn every useless, worthless thing out of our lives in Jesus' name. And the fire came upon Isaiah's lives and lives. Now also in verse 8, I had the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, everybody, one, two, three, go. Here am I, send me. Everybody, here am I, send me. Once again, here am I, send me. But understand, it was after the power came, after the fire came, after the fire burnt every chaff, every worthless sin away. It was then he had the voice of the Lord. After the fire of God has come upon your soul, after the fire of the Lord has come within your spirit, you cannot just remain like where you were before. You will rise up. When that kettle, look at that kettle, when the kettle is burning, you'll be hearing sound. When that kettle, when that kettle is boiling, the water inside is boiling, the lid will go up and everything that closed you up and bound you down and then kind of shut up your mouth. The Holy Ghost comes within, power comes within, fire comes within, and everything closing your mouth will shut up, will go off in Jesus' name. And then you will speak the word of the Lord. You speak that word with power in the name of Jesus. In uh, Isaiah chapter 64, Isaiah chapter 64, and I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 64, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that thou would wrench the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, and the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And it says, as when the melting fire burneth. The melting fire burneth. That is, the Holy Ghost comes upon the believer, comes within the believer. You are immersed in the Holy Ghost. You are totally endued with the Holy Ghost. You are endowed in the power of the Holy Ghost. And then you are surrounded with fire, spiritual fire, supernatural fire inside you and around you. Then it says, as the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil. To make thy name known to thine adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence when a preacher has the power of the holy ghost and then he speaks to the people the people will be convicted they'll be trembling there'll be conviction and then they will call upon the lord they'll fall upon their faces saying have mercy upon us O lord there'll be forgiveness there'll be salvation and there'll be restoration backsliders will come to know the lord and the power of the Lord will change and transform lives. It will happen in this coming November crusade in Jesus' name. And look at this. Look at how the word of God is when you're filled with the Holy Ghost. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And when the fire power of the Holy Ghost is upon you, the words you speak, the words you preach, and the word should declare the gospel of grace and the gospel of God that should declare. See what it will do in Jeremiah chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 28 and verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. And we're reading from verse 28 and verse 29. Look at this. The prophet that has a dream. Okay, let him tell a dream. And he that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Anybody having the word of God there? I said anybody having the word of God there? Anybody having the word of salvation? The word of restoration? And the word of faith that you can preach to the people? Then tell that word, speak that word, testify that word, and proclaim that word faithfully and powerfully and fire with, the fire, with fire in your soul. It says, and what is, what is chaff to the wheat, says the Lord, Numbers 29, is not my word like as a fire, 
It's not my, my word. Like as a fire says the Lord. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. When that word is coming from a spirit baptized person. When that word is coming from somebody that has the fire power of the Lord. It will melt the hard hearts like wax. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. It says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a what? Burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. You know, there are some people, they say they are believers. They say they are children of God. They say they are even workers. And then something happens, and they say, I'm not going to witness. I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to tell anybody about the word of God, about the word of salvation. And I can stay like that for one week. And stay like that for one month. And stay like that for one year. And there's no, there's no urge in them. There's no fire in them. There's no zeal in them. There's no kick inside them. There's nothing pushing them. You will doubt whether they really had what they were professing to have. But look at Jemma. Jemma said something happened. The children of Israel were not listening. And the people in Jerusalem were not listening. So I said, there's no point talking to them. There's no point preaching. There's no point declaring anything to them. He said, then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak anymore in his name. But he said, I couldn't stay like that. I couldn't keep quiet. Because there was something inside me when the scripture and the spirit, when they are inside you, when the word and the wonder working power of God, when they are inside you, you will not be quiet. I said you will not be quiet. I'm looking at somebody that cannot be quiet. That will preach the word. That will declare the word. That whatever is happening around you, you will rise up. Look at what he said in the middle of that verse 9. But his word was in my heart. As a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing. And I could not stay. You will preach the word. And when you preach the word, look at the effect. Look at the effect. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 24. Verse 24. And the first part of verse 25. Acts chapter 24. I'm looking at verse 24. It says in chapter 24 verse 24. It says over here. It says, and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla. Which was a joyous, joyous. He sent for Peter, he sent for Paul, and they heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Look at this. And as he reasoned, as he preached, as he proclaimed, as he declared, as he laid line upon line, precept upon precept, as he spoke logically, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix, what did he do? Tell me out aloud. Felix trembled. He couldn't be neutral to the word. And when you speak like that, you speak intelligently. When you speak, you speak logically. When you speak, you speak convincingly. When you speak, you speak with power. You speak with authority. And you speak with unction of the Holy Spirit. People will go on their knees, people will fall on their faces, and people will stand up, they will pray, they will confess their sins, repent of their sins, and they will come to the Lord in Jesus' name. In this coming crusade, that's what is going to happen. You'll see it yourself. I said, you'll see it yourself. And then the people that come by the grace of God, you'll be part of their vestas that will harvest them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Fervent and fiery. It was Pentecostal preaching that came through Peter. The preaching was powerful. The preaching was passionate. The preaching was pungent. The preaching was pregnant. The preaching was persuasive. The preaching was purposeful. The preaching was piercing. 
As you look at the Acts of the Apostles, in that first crusade, as Peter stood up and he began to declare the word of God to them, that's what you call Pentecostal preaching. It's not, you know, a preaching that you're preaching and then you're sleeping. A preaching, kind of preaching, declaring, and then the congregation is sleeping. And the congregation is looking at their wristwatch and saying, when is he going to round up? When is he going to finish? Want to go back home? And somebody goes up and somebody is talking to another person. In this kind of preaching, they cannot do that. Their eyes were glued to Peter, preaching unto them with Pentecostal power. And it was a powerful preaching. And I pray it will be transferred into your life in Jesus' name. Passionate preaching. And I pray that the next, thing you stand, the next time you stand up and you declare the word of God, it will be passionate preaching in Jesus' name. It was pungent. It was pungent. And it was punching as well. It's like when you punch somebody and the fellow, the fellow cannot just remain like that because it's a great punch and it's a great thing. It's poignant. That means it's, like a, it's like a sword that is piercing the person, piercing kind of preaching. And I pray that as you yourself, as you are affected by the word, if you need any restoration, you'll be restored. You need revival, you'll be revived. And you need any kind of the power of the Holy Ghost turning you around, transforming your life. Your time has come for revival. It will happen in Jesus' name. Like a rushing mighty wind, with a clear sound from heaven, delivered with the tongue of flaming fire, the message moved the people until they were asking, men and brethren, what shall we do? Their response was spontaneous. Spontaneous. Even before any altar call was made, the people said, we want to give our lives to the Lord. Anything we need to do so that we can come into the kingdom, so that our sins can be forgiven, so that our lives will totally change. Their response was, uh, was spontaneous. The inquiry was urgent. Inquiry. What shall we do? What shall we do? We want to give our lives to the Lord. We want to have a change. And then after having a change, we want to know where to continue with this kind of message. We want to know if you can take us to a place where we can keep on hearing something like this. Every time the inquiry was urgent and their readiness was obvious. The readiness was obvious. When the word of God goes out, the people that really want to come to the Lord, their readiness to come will be obvious. Their repentance was genuine. Their repentance was genuine. When he turned to the Lord, as Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They repented. They came in and they never went out again. Not only that, their conversion was clear. Their conversion was clear. That's why it says, many of all of them, 3,000 people, they came to know the Lord and they stayed in fellowship. They stayed in prayer. They stayed in studying the word of God. Their faith was real. And their water baptism was appropriate. Their fellowship was authentic. Fellowship authentic. Let's come to point number two now. The promised Pentecost for Christ's followers. The promised Pentecost for Christ's followers. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 38 and verse 39. After they asked the question and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Look at uh, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by the authority of Jesus Christ. And how would they baptize the authority of Jesus Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? And then he goes on to say in that verse 38, And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is, you get born again, you get saved. Don't stay there. You get baptized in water. 
don't get don't stay there you are discipled don't stay there you'll be taught what to follow don't stay there and then you'll be sanctified don't stay there you are consecrated to the Lord don't stay there you're also baptized in the Holy Ghost so that all it took the apostles it took them three and a half years they've been following and following and following after about three years they were sanctified and then they kept on following and they were tarrying and after some months they were baptized in the Holy Ghost but you don't have to wait that long time get saved you don't have to wait long time get baptized you don't have to wait long time get sanctified you don't have to wait a long time be filled with the Holy Ghost you don't have to wait a long time you receive the power the power to witness and the power to preach and you become a preacher yourself these uh, converts who are going to come in they'll soon become workers Amen. Amen. good day Amen you know, I've been, by the grace of God, I've been going to various, uh, uh, various states and various uh, cities and various uh, regions. And, uh, you know, we've seen converts. Uh, you know, the other time we went, some people came to know the Lord. And you know that in that uh, local place, in that uh, locality, uh, the next time uh, I got there, I heard that one of them was already an interpreter, interpreting for people that were preaching because he knew the language, he knows the language very well. And he said, one of these converts, they were able to bring. And then many people too have been seeing them now, they are up and doing. If I tell you, we, we have, you know, we go for a crusade somewhere, and more than 2,000, more than 2,000 will abide and be integrated to the church. Another local place, more than 1,000. Uh, integrated to a church, coming to Bible study, coming to Sunday worship, and this one in Lagos, I believe that uh, hundreds and hundreds will be added to every local church. Added to every district church in Jesus' name. And then look at the promise here now in verse 39. For the promise is unto you. The promise is for me. I said the promise is for me. The promise is unto you and to your children, to your converts, and to all that are far up the gentle places, and even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promised Pentecost for all of Christ's followers. Actually, see what the Lord had promised. We're coming to Luke chapter 3. The promise of the Lord for everyone that comes into the kingdom. In Luke chapter 3, we're looking at verse 16. Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you, tell me, he shall baptize you, say it out aloud, say it with conviction, Say it with expectation. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You can see the promise then. Your own Pentecost has come. Power has come. Fire has come. It is yours for the asking and you will receive in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 24, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, it is promised to every one of Christ's followers, everyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not just waiting for the uh, initial experience of conversion. You go on, you have consecration. You go on, you have sanctification. You go on, you have spirit baptism. It says in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Are you there? I send the promise of my Father upon you. I said, are you there? He says the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Until ye be endured with what? Tell me out aloud. With power from on high. How will that happen? Uh, in John chapter 7, how do we receive the power? In what condition should we be? What should be the state of our heart, our expectation, if we're going to receive uh, that power? In John chapter 7, verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Somebody must be thirsty, must be hungry, must be desirous, 
must be passionate, must be seeking, must be praying. I want this. Fire. I want this. The wind. I want this. Illumination. I want this. Insight into the word of God. I want this. The zeal of the Lord. I want this. The fire to be burning inside me. I want to preach like Peter. I want to be like Elijah. I want to be like Paul the Apostle. I want to be like those worthies of old that courageously declare the word of God. And as we go to this uh, crusade, November, tell me, November 8th until November 12th, you're not just, uh, well, you're going to hear the word of God, but you're not going as a sinner, you're going as a worker. You're going as a counselor. I said you're going as a counselor. But you're also going to receive. There's going to be a conference in the morning, conference for the ministers. Clear your dates, clear everything from that age to uh, from that nine, ten, eleven. You clear your dates in the morning. There'll be teaching that will teach the workers how to evangelize, how to win souls, how to have the fire inside them, how to have the power of the Holy Ghost inside them. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. Commit those days to the Lord and say, these days in the morning I'll be there, in the evening I'm going to be there. How you will eat in the afternoon if you're going to eat, make arrangement for that. And if you're not going to eat, how you're going to wait upon the Lord and you're going to tarry, but you must keep strong physically so that in the morning you are there, in the evening you are there. Those days and when once we finish like that, you begin the follow up, it's going to be a great harvest into the kingdom in Jesus' name. There must be desire in inside you. There must be a passion inside you. This thing doesn't take place every month. It doesn't take place every year. And this is the time for you to commit yourself and it says in verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water is going to flow from you. I said it's going to flow through you. But this big key of the spirit which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. It tells us in John, and look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 12. John chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 12. It's still talking about the power inside you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you became a great soul winner? I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if you became a great harvest in the kingdom of God? Wouldn't it be wonderful if tens and hundreds and thousands of souls through you will come into the kingdom of God? Through you they'll be saved, through you they'll be healed, through you they'll be delivered. God can do it. I say God can do it. If that desire is there, if that passion is there, He will do it through you as He did it through them in Jesus' name. John chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, who is that? He that believeth on me, I said, who is that? He that believeth on me, where is he? I said, He that believeth on me, where is he? Where is she there? Look at what will follow. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. Is that possible? Will it happen? When will it begin? I said, when will it begin? It will begin this time. It says, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do. A new level of answered prayer is coming in your ministry. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Then it says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you. For how long? Holy Ghost abiding with you for how long? Power abiding with you for how long? The fire abiding inside you for how long? The seal abiding inside you for how long? Forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but she know him, for he dwelleth with you, 
and shall be in you. And shall be in you. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized, ye shall be baptized, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when that Holy Ghost comes upon you in a baptismal measure, what will happen? But say it, but ye shall receive power. Somebody there, ye shall receive power. Somebody there, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, amen, amen. and in Judea, amen. amen, and in Samaria, amen, amen. and unto the uttermost part of the earth, amen. amen. It will happen in Jesus' name. You see, following Christ makes us recipients of great, grand promises. At the entrance of the kingdom is the promise of salvation. As you're coming in, a sinner is coming in. And at the entrance, he has salvation. Because except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So at the entrance of the kingdom is the promise of salvation. As you're coming into the kingdom and you're following Christ, he grants you more and more. The farther we go, the more we see. And the deeper we consecrate our lives to the Lord, the more we receive, the higher we aspire, the more we benefit. Following on, we discover the salvation. Following on, we discover the sanctification. Following on, we discover the spirit baptism. There's peace. There's purity. There's power. You see, there are people, if they just come in at the entrance of the kingdom, and they have pardon, they have the peace of God, they have rest in their soul, they say, praise the Lord. I feel calm. Praise the Lord. My sins are forgiven. Go further. Go higher. Go deeper. And go on with the Lord. After peace, there will be purity. And then he purifies the heart. He purges the heart. That's sanctification. And then that's not enough. Go on. Go on. There's still a lot for you. Even as you are here tonight, there's a lot for you. Heaven is saying, come, come. You've got this, you've got this. Come. You're going to get more. Peace, the purity, and then there is power. Put it another way. There is salvation at the entrance. There's sanctification as you come in. And then the spirit baptism as you move on of the Lord. Put it another way. As you come in, there is grace. The grace of God. That's the grace that pardons you. That's the grace that takes away all your sin. You don't stay there. Move on. There is godliness. Godliness. That's righteousness. That's inward purity. That's inward uh, sanctification. And then move on. There's the gift of the Holy Ghost. Grace godliness and gift, sanctification, purity and holiness of heart, cleansing and circumcision of heart precedes, that is, it comes before the baptism in the Holy Ghost. The heart is made holy before the Holy Ghost can take its residence in the heart. He is holy as the Holy Spirit. And if he's going to take Christmas in your heart and stay there and abide forever, you must be holy. The heart must be pure and the heart must be sanctified. Baptism, that's immersion, that's endowment, that's power, that's refreshing, that's boldness, that's zeal, that's insight. Those are gifts, exploits, all are promised to the waiting to be possessed. Somebody is going to possess tonight. I said somebody is going to possess tonight. Now, let's come back to this, Acts chapter 2. We have something very important now to pass out. 
something very most essential in this passage of scripture point number three is the proper preservation of the crusade fruit the proper preservation of the crusade fruit i'm reading from acts of the apostles chapter 2 and uh, let me read from verse 40 and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this unto what generation then look at this they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them how many i said how many about three thousand souls and look at this and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers i want you to look up here as we look at those verses you remember that these people that were born again when we just say three thousand that's just number when we say 3,000 people, 3,000 souls, it's like, I look at all of you now, and uh, whatever the number we are here tonight, you come from different places. How do we follow up on you, if we were to follow up on you? The way we do the follow up, as you go to your various places, there's somebody waiting for you back home. It's called coordinator. There's somebody waiting for you back home. It's got group pastor. There's somebody waiting for you back home. Where you came from, it's called your rep. Or if it's in the stage, state overseer, region overseer, local government pastor, group pastors, and then the pastors and the location pastors. As we all scatter to the places we're going, there must be somebody there that will collect us together in a little corner there and he's doing the follow-up and he's teaching us you see these three thousand people let me remind you once again they did all come from jerusalem a number of them yes from jerusalem but you have a lot of them that came from other places let's look at them number one they came from judea look at chapter two chapter two i'm reading from verse nine in verse 9 it says that's acts of the apostles chapter 2 verse 9 it says a uh, persian it says uh, medes and it says the elamites and uh, then it goes on uh, it tells us look at uh, verse uh, 14 acts of the apostles chapter 2 and verse 14 but peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and he said unto them ye men of tell me tell me out aloud some of the people where did they come from i said where did they come from judea remember what jesus said he shall receive the holy ghost and he shall see power when the holy ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me first teen, tell me the word jerusalem and tell me the next place in judea and look at this some people have come to, from judea to attend the feast and many of them, among the 3,000, they would have been born again. But do you know, the apostles did not send people after them when they went back home. They only collected the people in Jerusalem. And good follow-up was taking place in Jerusalem, centrally. But then the people that went to Judea, look at chapter 8. Chapter 8. After chapter 2 chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Now we come to chapter 8, long time after. It tells us in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at, the, at that time, uh, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout, tell me, the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. It's now only after the persecution, after so many years, the people that were there on that day of Pentecost, and they came to know the Lord, it's only in chapter 8 now, they'll be gathering them together. They'll be saying, were you there that? Yes, we were there, but nobody to teach us. 
were there, nobody to follow up on us, were there, nobody to make us go forward in the way of the Lord. Let's come back to chapter 2 and see the people that were there. We're looking at this now in uh, chapter 2, and I'm reading verse 9 again. In chapter 2, verse 9, it talks of patience. Patience. And then it goes on to say, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in uh, Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus. That's another place they had come from. Pontus. How about the follow-up? Remember, these people that came from Pontus, after the program, they are going to stay in Jerusalem. They will go back to their native land. They will go back to their place. If we are going to follow up on them, we need to have their record. We need to have their names. We need to have the towns they came from. We need to have their telephone number. We need to have their contacts. We must capture everything. And then we must know this is where they have gone. Do you know, where do we see them now? Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18, uh, the people that came from Judea, they were even lucky because, uh, you know, after about seven chapters, eight chapters, they got to them. But look at this one. We're talking about uh, the people that came from Pontus now, chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And he found a certain, uh, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in, tell me, Pontus. And then he goes on to say, he lately come from Italy uh, with his wife Priscilla, because, they, because the Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And they came uh, came unto them. You see, oh, it's so over here now. We are hearing the mission of Pontius. All those people, the fruit of the crusade that came to the Jerusalem crusade in chapter two. If they have said everybody wait, we need to have your detail. Yes, well, the counseling is going to capture your name. It's going to capture your number. They need to have the phone number now, but we have the phone number. We're going to capture your number. We're going to capture where you have come from. And then we look at everything. The computer will help us do the network, and they'll help us uh, classify everything. These people from Cappadocia, these people from uh, Pontus, and these people from Judea. And then we'll see the number. Out of these 3,000, the number that came from there is there. The number that came from there, we capture everything we have them on our database and as we have them on our database we'll be sending messages to them and then we'll send people to them that follow up will be thorough and this time in this coming crusade a follow up will be thorough in jesus name do i see they are here any amen there uh, look, at, we're coming back, we're coming back to, we must study the Bible. We're coming back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 9. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 9. After mentioning Pontius, what's the final word there? I said, what's the final word there? Asia. And uh, you see over here now, part of the converse will have come from Asia. And where is Asia in chapter 2 after this uh, verse? And where is Asia in chapter 3? Where is Asia in chapter 4? Where is Asia in all the other chapters? When did they eventually get to Asia? Something that could have been done at that time uh, if they made a sort of follow-up and if they captured all the people, if they said, he came from there, he came from there, he came from there, you, you go to that place, be a pastor there, you go to that place, uh, be a pastor there. We're coming to first Corinthians chapter 16 verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 16, and I'm reading here from verse 19. If we're not throwing a follow-up, we're going to miss all these people from Pontus, all these people from Cappadocia, all these uh, converts from Asia, all these converts that came from even nearby Judea, from the suburb, we're going to miss them. But this time, we're not going to miss anybody. I said we're not going to miss anybody. First Corinthians chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 19. It says in verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Ah, look at this. But we have to wait until later in the Acts of the Apostles to get a church in Asia. And then for Paul the Apostle, Paul was not converted 
in chapter 2. Paul was not converted until chapter 9. And it took Paul that had the vision for evangelism and the vision for church planting and the vision for harvesting to come. And then he went to Asia, he went here, he went there, he went here. It was then he met some of these people there that said, actually we have known the Lord, but there's no church here. And he started planting churches there. It is at this time when all these people come for this crusade, it's at this time church planting will take place. It's at this time in gathering will take place. Uh, let me show you. There are many others. I'll show you just one before I now round up. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And we're reading here from verse 11. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. We're reading from verse 11. I want you to pronounce the first uh, city there. One, two, three, go. Crete. It says, Crete and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. You know what? The people that came from Crete, it's a province, it's an island, and all those people came to Jerusalem at this time, and they took part in this Feast of Pentecost, and part of them became born again with these 3,000 people. But you see, the apostles, they followed up in the central follow-up arrangement in Jerusalem. And these people from Crete, what happened to them? What happened to them is that nobody took care of them. They just did the best they could. I come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 27. Acts of the Apostles chapter 27. And I'm reading from verses 12 and 13. Acts chapter 2. We're reading from the chapter, chapter 27, sorry. And then we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, And because the heaven was not commodious to winter, to winter in, the more part advised to depart. Hence, this also, if by any means they might attain to Phenice, and their winter, and which is an heaven of What's the word there? Crete. And lies toward the southwest and the northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, and loosing theirs, they sailed close by Crete. And this was the time when Paul the Apostle had some contact with Crete. And eventually, look at verse 21. Verse 21. It says in verse 21, But after, a long, after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. We shall have stayed longer, longer in Crete. Because now all these a storm we got into wouldn't have gotten into them if we stayed longer there and to have gained this harm and loss but you understand all those converts came and those converts that came from Crete nobody followed up on them they didn't, they didn't capture them I didn't know that anybody came from those areas and yet they had them praising the Lord and they were part of the 3,000 that came to know the Lord and eventually I want you to see Titus now chapter 1 Titus chapter 1 after a long long time after Paul the apostle was almost even finishing his ministry now and now he's making arrangement. This is the arrangement we should have made from Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. He's making arrangement to follow up on those people. It says in uh, chapter 1 of Titus, I'm reading from verse 5. It says, for this cause, let I, let I thee in what place? In Crete. All those people coming from Acts chapter 2 that had known the Lord that had the gospel, and they were part of the people that gave their lives to the Lord. A few of them there, it was now Paul the Apostle, after so many years, was making arrangements. He says that thou should search in order the things that are wanting, because the people just did service the way they knew how. Nobody to direct them. And so a lot of things were wanting. And when Paul the Apostle got to them, he said, where did you get the gospel? 
How did you know this? Why are you doing like this? Why are you doing like this? I must send somebody to you. What you should have done? Acts chapter 2. Who will set six in order? Look at that. And ordained elders in every city. There were many cities around there. Coming from that island. It was now Paul the apostle. After so many years. Was going to send them. I was going to appoint elders through this minister. Titles as I had appointed thee. But what kind of church did they have there? That uh, Titles was now taking care of. Look at them. Verse 10. Well, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Those circumcision people, those religious people who are not born again, they had gone to preach before the apostle could even send titles. And he says titles, they are there now. We didn't do the follow-up in time. Because of that, all these circumcision people, religious, but not having salvation, they are now there, whose mouths must be stopped. But by who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for fear they look as sick. The people who are covetous and poor who are, you know, serving for money, they are gone there before even Titus got there. Look at uh, verse uh, 13. It says, This witness is true. Wherefore, he brought them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. They were there, born again. They were not sound in the faith. They were there. They said, Well, yes, we've heard about Jesus. We heard about resurrection. In fact, when Peter said on that day of Pentecost, save yourself from this unto our generation, we came out with all the people. But since that time, nobody saw us and nobody followed up on us. And we're just doing the best we can. They were not sound in the faith. Actually, many of them had backsliding. And many of them were just saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. Look at verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, and disobedient and to every good work reprobate they had gone back to their vomit they had gone back to their evil ways that's why at this time that this crusade is taking place we're not going to make the same mistake we're going to do follow up and the follow up is going to be thorough you'll be part of it in jesus name the follow-up of crusade converts must be immediate. We're not going to wait until another five chapters, another five years. The follow-up must be immediate. Not only that, it must be thorough. It must be thorough. We'll capture the names, we'll capture the numbers, and then we'll send it to the central places in the districts, and then in the groups, and then in the old, uh, in the old group, and everywhere. The follow-up will be detailed detailed. That means everything we can know about the people. Actually, before the crusade, you are contacting them. You are inviting them. You are writing their name on that Operation Andrew card. And then you are praying for them. You are learning from them. You are learning about them. You are befriending them. And those details you already have. And then you come to the crusade together. There will be transportation that will bring you and your invitees and the people. And then the photo will be painstaking painstaking. That is, everything we need to do, we're going to do to make sure that nothing is lost and nothing is missed out. The follow-up will be exhaustive. Exhaustive. Everything we ought to know. Everything we ought to do. We're going to do so that these people that are coming to know the Lord, we're not going to lose anyone in Jesus' name. We're not being like, a, like an unwise um, fisherman who spends all the energy and he catches the fish out of the river and then throws them back into the river again. No, we're not going to do that. And our follow-up will be current. It will be current. What it means that is that concurrently, as the crusade is going on, the follow-up is going on. Those who get born again, converted on uh, November 8th, that same night, we're going to send messages to them. And then for the rest of the crusade days, we're sending messages to them, we're visiting them, and we're doing everything that the uh, follow-up is concurrent with uh, the crusade going on. Their phone numbers and their email and their residence and their family, everything will be captured and their working place and their background, everything will be done. And you and I will do our part in Jesus' name. I'll do my part. I said, I'll do my part. 
Number one, you follow up like a friend. Like a friend. You're not going there to judge. Somebody is still using jewelry. How about that? Leave that alone. You don't clean the fish before you catch the fish. They don't know anything about them. Leave, leave jewelry and leave dressing and leave palming and leave whatever it is. Leave all that. What we're concerned about now is that a person knows that Jesus died for me as a sinner. If I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will forgive me. He will save me. And then I'm ready for heaven. So don't talk about things that, you know, are just on the sideline now so that you are there as a friend. You are there as a relation. As if this is your junior brother. As if this is your senior sister. And then you are there as a co-tenant. As if you were living together. And you are going to build confidence. You are going to build love. And you are going to cherish them. You are going to follow up on them. You are praying together. You are interceding for them. Until they are established in the kingdom of God. And thank God they are going to be established. I say, thank God you are going to be established. And look at how, uh, before we pray, look at how you are going to do it. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter, one, chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 7. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7. It says, but we are gentle among you. You are going to be gentle with those converts. They have just come to know the Lord. They don't know everything that you have known. And you will be slow in correcting whatever this and that. It says we are gentle among you Even as they not cherishes our children So being affectionately desirous of you You love them You want to see them You visit them You are passionately desirous Affectionately desirous of them We are willing to have imparted unto you Not only the gospel of God But also our own very souls Because you are dear unto us For you you are dear unto us. They'll be dear to you. They'll be precious to you. Their souls will be precious to you. They have come to know the Lord. They will not perish. I said they will not perish. They will not sleep through your fingers. And they will not go back into the world again. Because you are following up on them. Because you are doing everything that needs to be done. And you are capturing them to stand. And to stay. And to remain. And to abide in the kingdom of God. In verse 9 it says. For, we, for ye remember brethren. Our labor and travail. You will labor your travail. For laboring night and day. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you you will spend and be spent for them if uh, you, you need to bring them and the boss is not coming any time and you need to pay for the fear God will provide for you and everything you spend during this crusade out of your own pocket the Lord will multiply a hundredfold and give unto you it says, we preach unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You will do it. I said you will do it. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. You cannot forbear. You have not seen them one day, two days, and then you say, well, uh, they have come to know the Lord. Everything will be all right. No. Paul the Apostle said, I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means uh, the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. The labor of the crusade preacher and the labor of all the churches and the labor of deeper life, yours and mine, will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Look at verse 8. For now, we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Those converts will live, will be happy, will be joyful, and will know that our labor is rewarded if they stand fast in the Lord. For what signs can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God night and day, night and day, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face. You want to see their faces, you want to know them, and you want to approach them so lovingly that we might see your face and might perfect 
that which is lacking in your faith. They don't know everything yet and because of that, you want to follow up on them and help them so that they will know the Lord. Everything you have known little by little, precept after precept and gradually, slowly, you're going to impart everything unto them until they are well established in the church with you here in deeper life in Jesus' name. A lot to do, but we are ready. A lot to do, but we are able. A lot to do, and the Lord will strengthen every one of us in Jesus' name. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Can I hear your voice? I said, are you ready? It will be done. Let's rise up. Let's rise up now. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we're ready. Lord, we're ready. Lord, we're ready. And in all the various estates and all the various regions where we're hearing this word of God together, maybe your own crusade is coming to you. Maybe he will soon visit you. And maybe he will soon have a, another great harvest in your region, in your city, in your state. Let's get ready so that all these, when that time comes, we're going to you apply and when we have gone already for crusades and we're doing follow up now let's make sure that we gather the fruit we gather the harvest so that nothing is lost let the lord hear your voice open your mouth and pray to the lord